YouTube. I'm just redoing a video I did about a year ago, I guess, and it got like almost 5,000 views on the setup I use and how I configure my XR18 with the Xair software for my drum set. Um, I'm redoing this video for a couple of reasons. One, I, I did change over the microphones. I've got um, condenser mics on the toms now. Um, I replaced the PGA 56 dynamic mics I had on my toms with um, bare dynamic gooseneck condenser mics. So that made some changes. I've also changed what I'm running in the FX bus. So with those two, they were enough, I think, to, to just redo this video, go back over some things, and actually also in, uh, expand upon some of the parts of this that I was getting asked a lot of questions in the, um, in the previous video, so I'll address them here with this new video. So without further ado, uh, this here is my XR18 set up. I use quite a few channels here. I've got a lot of close mics for my drums and cymbals. So um, there's a lot here. And I dual mic both the kick and the snare. So that adds quite a bit to the complexity, I guess, of the setup and just some of the considerations you might want to take as you're doing your own uh, setup of whether you've got an X air um, based XR18 or, or Behringer digital rack mounted mixer or some other digital mixer, a lot of this stuff is going to apply the same regardless. So let's talk about the, the gain staging across all of these first. So um, if you go to the input, you can look at the gain staging here, but it's also crowded with a bunch of other stuff. The input is a little bit more... Um, concise. I I target my gain staging in each mic. First of all, from the standpoint of setting up gain staging, I'm doing it by hitting the drum or the cymbal as, as hard as I reasonably can without breaking it. Um, I want the maximum signal I can because I want to have the right amount of headroom. When you're gain staging on an analog mixer, you can gain stage to sort of a, a zero dB level, and um, that's giving you a full signal. And then if you go over it, you've got another usually 10 or even more dB of sort of the warning area before you start getting into the red, which will indicate some clipping might be happening. In a digital mixer, once you run out, once you hit zero, um, anything beyond that is going to get clipped. So you, what you do is you, you, uh, you set your level to a minus something value. I try to do at the hardest hit that I can do on reasonably on the drum or the cymbal to about a minus 10, maybe as little as a minus 15, but no less than that. Because I'm hitting and, and getting the maximum signal, the odds of it going more than 10 dB above even that is going to be exceptionally rare. Um, perhaps if I literally hit the microphone itself with the stick or something like that, that might happen. But, um, you know, you could, if you wanted to really play it safe, you could set your gain staging at around minus 20. And then, you know, if you're not hitting as hard as you can, and then all of a sudden you start doing that, you're not, you're still not going above. It leaves you even more. Now you got 20 dB of headroom for that. Um, but I want a strong signal because I want the signal processing to be able to really um, be able to function the way it should. So that's why I try to do the gain staging there. So anyway, um, with each microphone, I'm, I'm setting the gain staging to be um, right at about minus 10. Between, it's, it's falling somewhere in here. You know, it's always bouncing up and down, so you can't really see it. And then unfortunately, there's not like a max. Like some, some meters will have a, a little bar that sort of sits there for a few seconds at the highest peak level of the, the signal. That's just not the case. Um, maybe one for the suggestion box for Behringer um, to add that into their meters. That sure would be nice. 
to be able to have that. But given that they don't, uh, you just do the best you can. And, um, you know, that's set for all of them. Uh, I'm just going to pause here at the snare bottom. In addition to the gain staging for my bottom, I've also um, activated the polarity reversal feature on that channel. So what that does is it just reverses the positive and negative polarity because I, I, I have a, a, a mic on the top of the snare and at the bottom. And for them to be uh, properly phased, uh, because the uh, as one head, as the top head goes in, the bottom head goes out, um, you're, you're getting a wave signal that's going to have an offset um, 180 degrees one from the other. And in order to not deaden that and cancel out the, the, the signal, I polarity reverse um, that. Now, these all four of these are dynamic mics, so none of them have phantom power. But once I get into my toms, now all of these are, dy are condenser mics, and so each of them have the phantom power. My overheads are condenser mics, and they are stereo linked. So um, the overhead right and left have the stereo linking, and then again, you get into the, the um, hi-hat and ride. They are not stereo linked, but they are also condenser mics. So those um, have a, a phantom power going to them as well. I, I really am not going to get into these other channels. I, I don't think they're going to be useful for most people. It's just some things that I use. Um, you know, the only other one is going to be my TM2. This is my trigger module. What I do is I bring this into channels 17 and 18. Those are the um, TRS input channels. Uh, all the rest of the 16 channels before that are, are XLR input channels. Um, so this one is just a paired, a single um, grouping of a paired left-right channel for uh, 17 and 18, and I, I bring in the, the feed from my trigger module into that. So um, that's the, the gain staging. Let me go back to the kick drums here and talk a little bit about some of these other signal processing features around gating, EQ, and compression. Um, so the, the kick drum is kind of unique in that it's the only one I truly use a full-on gate. Um, I don't really gate any of the other mics. I do use expanders, um, which is a form of gating, it, but um, it's, it's not quite as open, closed, and, you know, open, shut as the, um, the, a true gate is. So with the, uh, with the kick, I use gating because you really want a very focused, isolated, um, short duration thump. Um, and you want to be able to control a lot of that attack. So um, the kick out is a beta 52 that's just sitting on the outside of the rezo head. So that's really not getting any beater action at all. Um, I can have a fairly fast att attack on that and attack in the, for the purposes of gates is how quickly it will open. So the slower the attack, the slower the gate opens. Um, the shorter the attack, the quicker the gate will open. Um, so if you think about the instant that the beater, if you're looking at the in, inside, the instant that the beater hits the head, um, that's at zero milliseconds, and that sound will, will last for a few milliseconds. If you sort of want to eliminate the click of the beater actually striking the head, but still want to get a little bit of attack, um, for my particular setup and microphone, I find an eight millisecond attack works nicely for that. Um, I hear the attack, but I'm not getting any click of the beater hitting the, the head. So it's a good balance to me of the sound I'm trying to get. Um, and, and, you know, look, that inside kick mic is pressed right up, not pressed, but it's, it's just pointed right at the beater and, um, that, that batter head and it's very close to it. So it is really all attack. Uh, I could even slow that down even a little bit more to get, um, a less aggressive attack in the signal. But, uh, you know, for this, I just like the sound of where it's at, but anywhere from, probably uh, 8 milliseconds up to maybe a maximum of 12 to 15 milliseconds would be a good attack setting to eliminate the click of the beater but still get a nice um, hit sound from 
your your kick drum mic. Um, if you're single micing, you know you're going to put it towards the edge of your porthole, I guess, if you have a porthole at all, or it'll just be on the outside of the drum anyway. In which case, you know you can look more at five milliseconds or even less from an attack standpoint. Um, I just I just put a little bit of delay in opening the gate for the outside one because it from a sound standpoint as I was moving through the range that's where it sounded best. Um, and as far as all of these settings go, that's what you've got to do. You've got to listen to it. Um, I would suggest listening to it in, in just re just like it is. Don't uh, you can solo the channel or isolate the microphone. Um, to sort of, I guess, do some initial um, baseline setting up. But when it comes to listening to it, I, I would I would do it in the full mix and, and adjust from there. Because ultimately, this is what you're really hearing. You're never just listening to that, right? So um, just, a, just an approach I take, I, I hardly ever solo these channels, um, as I'm, as I'm trying to, to dial things in, I, I might do it in the very, very initial rough setup to get all the gross settings and, and, and things set up, um, initially, but any, any time I'm going to fine tune and adjust is in a full mix. Uh, anyway, so that's the, the kick microphone uh, and gating, uh, kick microphones from an EQ standpoint. Um, for most of the mics, this is not 100% of the time, but for most of the mics, um, EQing will be, uh, or for most of the channels, I should really say, but, but it all comes down to a microphone input. I'm looking at and listening for what I don't like coming out of the signal. Very rarely am I trying to boost different parts to make them come out more. What I will do is take things that are not as pleasant out of the way of the 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 sounds that I enjoy uh, from each of these. So, so that's an approach that I've seen and heard a lot as far as EQing goes, and it's one that I follow as well. Um, so I'm doing a very very low low cut on on both of these. Um, you know, 50 hertz is about as low a signal as you get from a kick drum, especially a 20-inch like I'm running. Maybe if you had a big old 24 or even a 26-inch um, kick drum mic and a sub kick, you might want to drop that low cut down even further. But I find this is as low as you really need to go. And um, in, in the case of the outside, this is where a lot of my sound is coming from. The inside mic is really all just the attack. I'm trying to blend in with the nice thump of the kick from the uh, Beta 52 over here. Um, and that's why you see the, the different kinds of profiles. I'm adding back in some mid and high here to enhance the attack. I will usually always cut um, in, a, in a low mid area on, on each of these profiles and I try to do a little bit of a low end boost on a lot of these uh, channels. So this is usually about the only boost I'm really doing. I'm usually doing some cut here at the very least and, and other areas uh, and that's that's the EQing. From a compression standpoint, a lot of these drums and these channels, I am compressing to try and bring down the initial peak signal that you'll get a bit and keep a fairly even signal. Um, so I do some pretty, and a lot of the drums for recording and, and just for, for having uh, mic'd drums, I'm doing a fairly aggressive amount of compressing in, in each of these. I just like the sound of pretty heavily compressed drums um, for for the the style of music I play. So playing Christian contemporary, um, for the most part, I'm using compressing um, compression like like this for most of the channels. Um, now I do like to play a bit of Zeppelin, right? So it's a completely different profile for that. I will use very little compression. I really like to hear the 
the the very broad um you know dynamic range of the drum like you get out of um how bonham played and i just think it sounds better but for christian contemporary which is what i do this is this is an example on this channel and many of the other channels i'll show you i'll walk through of of what i would consider pretty heavy compression um you know and i'm just uh i'm just like you'll see too for the kick out that's where i want a nice you know low thump and i get that with a very quick attack so basically it's not letting the peak um through hardly at all um i'm holding the compression a decent amount of time because it's a the the bass drum is not resonating very long anyway and um releasing gradually over about a 35 millisecond release if you look in contrast at the inside mic you see a very long attack so in the case of the 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 one against the um that that's picking up the batter head i'm actually letting that peak happen a lot more um in the signal and that suits what that's doing now when i combine the two to get a overall sound of the kick the kick in and kick out it's combining to create a great sound again if you were single miking, you wouldn't do it this way right you'd probably be somewhere in the middle um, and it depends on where you're putting the mic. If you're putting the mic through a porthole, you're going to probably want to have a little bit of a, um, a little bit quicker attack than this, right? But not much. If you're on the outside of um, the drum, then, you know, maybe you have a profile looking a little bit more like this. Um, because you're just not going to pick up any beater action, if you will, right? So um, that's on, on the kick and um the compression so uh i don't really run any other effects aside from what's coming across the first two fx buses um over here are the mood filter and hall reverb so there is a bit of reverb that comes into the the kick um but that's it so um now if you look at the snare so the snare is very very lightly gated um with a, a two to one expander actually i don't even really truly gate um the snare again a two mic setup is going to be a bit different than what you do with one mic and i'll tell you the why you you really want to do you can see the the, the signal actually starting to open the expander up um a, a little bit just for me talking and i'm like 10 feet away i'm not even looking at my drum set i'm, I'm turned completely around from where my kit is um but it, it's still picking that up if you gate too heavily on the snare you're not going to be able to do you're not going to be able to like use brushes for example and sure if you're smacking the snare with the brush but if you're just um you know uh sliding the brushes across the surface of the snare you it, you won't pick that up You'll hear it sitting there, but when you go back to listen to your recording, you won't hear those brushes. Um, so that's why I really, on the top snare mic, I don't do much at all. This is really just to eliminate, uh, for example, if I'm, when I'm done playing, a lot of times I'm, I'm just going to set my sticks on, you know, nice and gently. I'm just going to set them down on the snare. Like, I just don't want to pick that kind of stuff up. Like, it's really only cleaning up the most obnoxious of little things that might bleed into the mic as you're um you know performing or or whatever but you cannot you cannot gate too extensively in in contrast if you look at what i do on the snare bottom so now i'm using a three to one expander i'm setting a little bit of a higher threshold and um if you also notice here i'm using a side chain filter with against channel three which is the snare top so what's opening my snare bottom expander if you will is the signal coming from the snare top the frequency i pick is 188 that is the um the fundamental frequency of the snare itself so that's why it's 188 hertz that's the fundamental note of my snare drum and um 
This is, to me, one of the probably best examples that I could think of, of where sidechain filtering on a gate is very, very handy. By doing this, that bottom snare mic is only really opening up when I'm hitting the snare. So if I'm not hitting the snare and I'm instead I'm hitting the kick or um, the high tom or the bass player is doing something and I'm getting all that rattling from the snare wires, which happens all the time, and there's almost nothing you can do about it. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, the mic isn't really picking it up that much because it's not a strong enough signal to open it itself. You know, it's the, that's why this threshold is so high over here. That's just not going to to bring the level up enough to really open this up and pick up that signal. But as soon as I hit the snare top, even almost as light as I want to, that's still plenty of signal with the sidechain filter to open this up. I just go into that level of detail here on this particular example because this is, uh, you know, a lot of people get confused, and I know I was confused around sidechain filtering with this and, and how it really works and everything, but, um, you know, this, by, by applying it in this way, I had the aha moment where, oh, this makes a lot of sense now as to how and, and why it should be used. I saw other examples where, you know, you if you got the bass player doing this, you want that. It, 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 it Honestly, it just, I think, confused me more. Hopefully, if you all have any questions on this part, please leave comments as um, you look through this. Uh, I find it, with dual miking the snare, this to be a, just a great application of sidechain filtering. Um, going back to the snare top, like I said, very little I mean, I just snap my fingers and, and it, it like literally is opening up. Um, so, so, <clears throat> and if you look at, uh, now the EQing, so here's another, and I'm only going to go through a lot of these, these settings on the, the kick and snare, because this is where they're, they're pretty critical. Um, the other, the toms, <laughs> you can, you can play around with all, you got a lot of latitude on toms. Um, but to really, you look, your snare and your kick are like the the backbone of the kit. I mean, it, these really have to be right to get a great sound. You can really mess up toms, overheads, and other things and still have an awesome sounding kit when you're recording or, or doing um, reproduction live, you know, through a PA system. Um, you, you know, it's it's as long as you nail these. So... Um, if you look at my other video around mic positioning, you'll see that, uh, especially for that snare top, I position that mic for maximum rejection from the cardioid pattern against the hats. So, um, that's where you got to start. Um, in addition to that, the, if you turn on the RTA, um, which, which will show you your, the, all of your different, um, frequencies coming into this. Um, this channel in this graph. Um, and when I hit my hi-hats, this uh, 2900 hertz area right here is where I see the peaks from the hi-hats. So what I do here is uh, with a very high quality, a 10, right, which makes this very, very narrow, I I just basically put minus 15, this, which is the maximum. I max out the reduction of this 2,900 hertz um, signal area here. And um, that, whatever other little bleed I might get, because the, the cardioid pattern isn't rejecting everything from those hats, is virtually eliminated by that. Um, and, and that's what I, I do to sort of clean up the hi-hat bleed from my top snare mic. Then um, I do another cut here in this nasty little 1200K high mid. Uh, it's not really even a high mid, but it's, uh, I use that particular channel for this because I just, I think that it gives that lower end, um, without boosting the low end, it's cutting out a high, very high part of the mid that I find to be undesirable. Um, and then I cut in two other areas. So like I, like I mentioned in the 
in in the um, with the side chain filter. The fundamental note of the snare drum is at about 188. Let's call it 190 hertz. Um, in and when you hit it though, you get a, a you've I'm sure heard the term of overtones, right? You can actually see overtones. So again, with the RTA on and you hit the snare, you will see this spike, especially around this 266. This is the overtone. So this is the, a, a higher frequency tone that is coming in uh, with the, the fundamental note, which is very pleasant, right? That 190 hertz sounds great. But then this 266, the overtone is... I don't like it, right? Most people don't. Most people start dampening the heck out of their snare drum or doing other things to it to try to eliminate those, quote, overtones. Um, what I do here is I just EQ it out. Um, so I find with the RTA on, I hit the snare, and I find where that, that peak is for that overtone, right? I could see that peak. I could see the peak from the fundamental. And I see another peak back here. Now, this is below the signal, so I don't know that I'd necessarily call it a quote overtone because it's not over the signal, but um, nonetheless, this is another area I cut out, not to the extent um, that I do this 266 hertz frequency here. Um, and you need to use a very, very high, the, the maximum quality that you can, right? So if you were to, to look at this as though it was a, um, you know, a, one of those graphic EQs or whatever, it would literally be one slider at this. Um, frequency pull down and all the other sliders would be up here. Um, that's just a way to visualize what this, <clears throat> what this is kind of doing. Um, so by doing that though, it cleans out all of the garbage and it, uh, it which enhances just naturally enhances cause it doesn't get in the way of the nice, pleasant sound. So there's no boosting required on this. Now with the snare bottom, um, I still do that exact same, um, you know, getting rid of the, the overtones because you'll pick them up. You, you don't just pick up snare wires with that bottom mic. You pick up the shell and you pick up, you know, the tone of the drum and everything. So it's, it's still a mic. Um, and and I, I do this reduction here around 1200 hertz as well. But I add back a little bit of high shelf boost at 2900 hertz. I do that because I've basically eliminated it here, right? So I'm adding it back in here, but it's because this microphone is at the bottom of the snare. It's miles away from the hats. Um, I get no bleed from the hats from it. So with, again, the dual miking, I can add that particular frequency back into this, this channel. And when I blend the two together, I'm, I'm enriching it with adding that back in from a microphone that's on the same instrument, but in a different position, that's not picking up the sounds I don't want anymore. Um, if, if you, if you can follow that, um, th this is just another technique that, that I've used and, and I've, I've had a lot of success with it. I'm, I'm going to do a whole, you know, sound run through uh, of this, uh, later when I get a chance to record all of that. So you can actually hear, I'll, I'll toggle these things on and off and you can kind of hear the differences, but, um, <clears throat> that's, that's how I approach doing the snare with the two mics. And that's why I like using two mics for the snare and the kick, because I can get the, the best sound, um, with multiple sources and blending and, and enhancing certain aspects with different mic positions on the same instrument. Um, and that's the whole thing. Like, I'm not a big, I've seen where at the snare top, somebody will pair a, will put like a dynamic mic and a condenser mic both together on the snare top. Uh, you know, but that probably does a good job. But I think by, by dual miking an instrument in two different mic locations, like you do with the kick in and out and the snare top and bottom. That's really the best use. If you're going to spend money on, on a, a second mic for the same instrument, that's probably a better investment than just throwing two mics at the top. Um, my humble opinion on, on that. Um, now, going into uh, the compression uh, here, uh, I, I find uh, a couple things. One, uh, again, very aggressive 
compression, very quick attack. So I'm, I'm, I'm clamping down that peak right away on the snare. Here's the interesting thing. A lot of people worry about compression, sort of um, eliminating the, the dynamic range of the instrument. Um, I, do not, I do not find that to be the case. I find soft grace notes and brushes to be soft and quiet and rim shots to be loud and, and cracking. Um, it, it doesn't do that. It, it just evens it out. Um, as you're, as you're playing. So, um, so don't be afraid of it. Um, but again, listen as you're, you're adjusting it so that you, you get the right effect and the result that you're looking for. Now, um, with the kick, I did not really have to uh, add any any makeup gain. This this even with this compression, when I looked at the signal coming in and the the post compressor signal coming out, it was still it was still pretty high. I'm not quite sure what that's all about, but for the snare, it was a lot more noticeable. And a lot of these other mics, it was much more noticeable. Maybe it's just the nature of the kick mics, but um, the compression I'm using here, even though it's not quite as aggressive a compression, I had to add back in um, a fair amount of makeup gain because I was losing a lot of the signal coming out um, from this. And th this is another way to use these meters. So you, you've got your input, and this is, should always be wherever you set your gain staging, right? As long as you don't have um, any of the, uh, you know, effects um, in, in the signal path, they, they shouldn't change that. But now that you've added this compression, you'll see the post-compression signal will drop. And, um, you know, I, I, so I added back in the makeup gain there. That's um, kind of important to do. I do the same thing with snare bottom. Not to the same extent because... If you look, I'm already dropping the fader um, down. And so if I were to add back all of the makeup gain, I'm just going to end up dropping the fader down even lower. Um, so I honestly didn't see much point. It wasn't that big of a difference. I was like, you know, sitting at around minus 10 here and about minus 15 here, right? So I could have add, added back another 5 dB of makeup gain, but... Um, it was for me close enough. I didn't bother. Um, plus, like I said, I'm because of my blending, and and I want that snare bottom to not quite be as um, upfront as the snare top. And that's the approach that I used. But ordinarily, what you would want to do is you would want to adjust your makeup gain so that you're when you exit this effect, you're coming back out at about the same level as when you went in, right? Um, and, and that's why you add makeup gain. Um, so those are the snare mics. Uh, like I said, the toms, we'll go to the, um, the gating for the toms because this is kind of an interesting um, setup. With the condenser mics, um, and I guess because of the way the gooseneck is positioning the mic a little bit more over the center of the drum rather than... Um, you know, right at the edge of the drum, I was getting quite a bit of attack. Quite a bit of the stick hit was um, was coming through the Tom mics. Also, they're a different brand, Bear Dynamic. I know they just behave a different way. Um, and this was one of the big changes. So I really, on the expander, I used a heavier expander, and I really, I used a 20 millisecond attack. Very, very, so this gate does not open up for, I mean, in, in terms of, of um, sound signal processing, 20 milliseconds is a long time. I mean, it's, an, it's 20 milliseconds, you know, millionths of seconds. It's, it's not, it, you know, but, but that's a, um, that's a, that's a forever attack, I mean, relatively speaking. But that was what it took to get the sound that I wanted. I, I just didn't, I was getting way too much stick in my toms uh, for the style of music I'm playing. Again, if I'm playing more like Led Zeppelin, I'll prob I would probably drop that down. 
Um, maybe I'd go down as low as 10 milliseconds. I cut that in half and let a lot more of that stick hit come through because that sound is better for that kind of music. For Christian contemporary, this made the sound better for that style of music um, that I was getting out of my toms. And I did, I did pretty much the same exact thing on every one of them. Um, you know, there might be some different, um, you know, releases and, uh, and such and different thresholds because, you know, different size toms have a different strength of the signal and so on, but, um, they're all really pretty much the same. Um, I might use a little bit lighter in the bigger ones because, um, the, the high and mid tom, I'm always hitting, I'm not really playing those very light ever. Whereas my floor toms, you know, I might be playing uh, a lot more accented type of, of, of um, notes on those, right? To where I'm, I'm, I'm doing like 16ths and, and I'm accenting like, you know, uh, the and or the uh, E of, of the, the song. So one E and a two E and a, you know, so something like that. And <clears throat> uh, it just, it, it was better to have a little bit less um, of that to, to get a little bit more of that to come through on the, the, the 14 and even more so on the 16. Um, but again, to eliminate that stick hit, these particular mics, that was, that was pretty much what it took. Um, so going back on now to the EQing, it, this is a very similar principle to the snare, um, EQing, but not to the same extent, I guess. So in this case, the um, each tom has, again, a fundamental note and an overtone. Um, now, when you're in a room, it's funny. When, like, if I'm just in the room playing, I honestly don't really hear the overtone that much. But when you're close miking these bad boys, you hear that overtone come through, like, a lot. So... Uh, again, here, some EQing can help to clean up the stuff that you don't want, more so than try to boost the things that you do want. Uh, I do boost, so, you know, the high tom's fundamental frequency is around 130, the mid tom is around 110, the uh, floor tom is about 80, the 14 inch is about uh, 85, and the um, 16 is about 65. That's just where all of the fundamental um, notes are. But then there's an a corresponding with each one of those is a corresponding overtone, a little bit higher frequency from that. So in those, I'm I'm cutting them out, I'm reducing them on each of the toms. So it's at about you know 130 is the fundamental. It's at about 148 for the high tom. And again, when you turn the RTA on, you'll see it. And and once you cut this, you'll hear the difference. All right? You 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 know you, you, I sort of started by noticing oh my, wh where's the, what's this spike over here like I see the spike here and that makes sense because I know the frequency of the tom but then what's this other spike and then when I eliminate it I was like oh that sounds a lot better um I suggest you do it that way so at 148 for the high tom for the mid tom it's down around 133 and as you go lower and lower in toms that that will keep dropping down and down and it's almost like if if you notice the fundamental frequency of the um, mid tom is about 110, and the overtone of the floor tom is that same kind of frequency, right? So it was just an interesting pattern that I saw. And then you know you go here too. Like the overtone for the 16 inch floor tom is around 88. The fundamental of the 14 inch tom was about 85. So the overtone of the next lower tom or next biggest seems to be right at where the fundamental and I have all of these are tuned at a perfect fourth um from one another. That's that's how I tune I tune a perfect fourth between the toms and I tune a perfect fourth between the batter and the rezo head. That might also have something to do with how the um the overtone is is coming through in the toms. Again, you've got to look at the principles of this and not necessarily my specific settings. Uh, in order to get results that you're going to like, um, because I've got different heads, I've got different tunings, I've got, every, you know, you, you just can't um, try to take this and, and apply it directly to your setup. You, but you can take the same kind of approach to find where these are in your, for the mics you use, and for the heads you use, and the tunings you use, 
on, on your drums. Um, then moving on to compression, uh, again, very fast attacks across the board on these, trying to keep a very, very even tone, fairly heavy compression, and lots and lots of makeup gain. Um, those bare dynamic condenser mics, when you compress them, had a lot more um, loss of signal than the dynamic mics. I don't know if that's a, a thing with condenser mics versus dynamic mics, um, and I might just be reading more into what it was than it was really there, but that's what I noticed is that they, the, the makeup gain had to be pretty, pretty um, substantial for these. And, um, you know, you can see kind of in all of these, though, the um, profile of you look you look here at the gain profile for how the compressor is acting upon the signal you, it, this is an aggressive <laughs> amount of compression um i would say so then uh going to the overheads this is a stereo pair kind of doesn't matter which one i pick um here very very light gating again with overheads like i want to pick up the soft little bell hits I might be doing on the bells of some of the crashes. Um, you know, I want to pick up the woodblock and the cowbell, which is pretty far away from the mics. Like, I don't, I don't want to be gating out too much. The other thing, too, with high sustain items, you don't want to gate them too aggressively because what will happen is, like, you'll hit, you'll hit the crash. And I noticed this with slightly heavier gating than what I'm doing here. You'll like hit a crash and then as the crash starts to fade away, you'll hear it cut out like completely. Right? As the as the signal as the signal as this starts coming right back down to where it's basically cut off. Right? Um and and that's just not a pleasant sound. Right. So by doing it this way and having extraordinarily long releases, you see this 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 release is like and the hold, very, very long, right? I mean, I could almost shut this off probably. Um, I, and I have. I've kind of toggled it on and off. I do hear a difference, but it's very, very slight. Again, I think what this is doing, like I'm talking in the room here, it's not going to pick up my voice, right? I mean, my voice is, tr is definitely being picked up. You can see the little green bar jumping up there as I'm talking, you know, and if I were to snap my finger, boom, it opened. I mean, just a finger snap. So th that would get picked up. Um, just me snapping my fingers from far away from the kid. I'm not under those mics at all. I'm easily 10 feet from those mics or more. Um, a nice loud, you know, or a clap. That's going to, that's going to open them up. So that, that, that gating I'm using is just to kind of clean up any little, you know, ambient noises that I wouldn't want going through there as I'm you know, taking a drink of water or whatever, right? Um, EQ wise, so uh, this is this is more or less uh, similar to my the EQ pattern of my main left right. Um, so you know, in, in this graphic EQ, you can see um, sort of like you know a little bit of a low boost, a, a mid cut, and another high boost over here. That's just the the pattern. Um, that I have for that. And the, um, the overheads, I've got a low boost. I got a mid cut. I got another high boost here. Um, again, cause it's an overall picture of the drums. Um, that's just a, a EQ profile that fits the style of music that I play, um, very well. And, um, and that's why I don't do much EQing on the main left, right? You can see these are almost all in the center. I could probably even just shut the EQ off for um the main left right out and not bother using it uh but i have it there and i have it on because if i'm playing in other settings and um in other venues and somebody wants to make some adjustments this is where i think it's just easiest just adjust it from the main left right out then trying to go into every one of these channels and make adjustments because that's just going to get way too time consuming so i leave the eq on and i have it saved to my scene that I use for my home studio. But then if I go out anywhere and, and the sound engineer wants to um, 
muck around with it and get a different, you know, sound, or I'm playing a different style of music that would have a, just a better, you know, high mid, you know, low and, and high mid boost, um, in there, then great. You know, we can add it in here, play the, the, the venue, and then I could just always apply my, reapply my scene and set it all back to the way I like it for my studio. Um, so that's, that's the EQ on the overheads and then compression on the overheads, I think is a pretty, you know, significant compression with a lot of symbols and other things. Just, just, I don't know, this sounds better to me with this amount, amount of compression. It's pretty significant. Um, you know, pretty, pretty slow attack. So I do let, um, a bit of the, the initial spike come through in the signal, but you know, otherwise it's, it clamps down on it pretty hard and keeps it pretty even. Um, so going to now the final piece of these hi hats here, and then we'll talk a little bit about the effects. Um, <clears throat> uh, the hi hats, uh, the hi hat and the ride both really have just very, very mild um, gating. Why? Because there's a lot of soft stuff that happens on those, right? Um, especially on the ride. In worship music, you know, you might just be like. Tss just very very gentle low um just honestly it's it's almost only there just to help try to keep everybody else in time um you almost don't even want it to be perceivable in in the rest of the music you want it coming across the stage wedges or whatever like nice but but you know and same thing with the hats sometimes you're just playing like it's really really soft and if you're if you're using too much gating you're just not going to get it come through the mic right so so that's why this is this is pretty low. Plus, again, mic positioning helps me with uh, a lot of the issues that people use gating to try to solve. So solve your issues with great mic position and great mics, and, and then you don't have to try to compensate by gating the heck out of it, you know? Um, but that's, that's the approach I use here on the hats. EQ-wise, so here now um, I got kind of the opposite problem, right? Where I had the hi-hat bleed into the snare drum mic. I have the snare can bleed into the hi-hat. So I use a pretty decent low cut. I mean, I could even go higher than this actually, but in just listening to it, uh, doing the low cut up at 104, I could have gone 200, 300. Um, but, you know, I found it actually started to take away a little bit from the hats. Um, and the ride when I went a little bit too much. So this was just the right balance between eliminating most, not all, right? You still hear the snare in this mic. Um, but it did eliminate quite a bit of the bleed from the snare and the toms and the kick and everything else. You know, look, it's a condenser mic, right? It picks up a lot. Um, so so that that's the approach uh, I took with that. And... Um, you know, as far as the other EQing, um, the mid cutting again, adding back in a little bit of boost at that. You see this 2900 hertz again. Um, you know, this is the fundamental signal, right? So this is where I, if I really want the hats to sizzle, you enhance the fundamental where that you see when you hit the hats, where you see that big spike. Um, this is where it is. And so I just add a little boost right there to help it along and then all the way up here at 16,000 hertz that really gives you a lot of that hissing sizzle sound is way up there um but the depending on the size of your hats and the style of music again this could all be different from a fundamental principle standpoint i think the important takeaways is use your low cut to get rid of the drums and get rid of a drum bleed into if you mic if you even mic your hi hat a lot of people don't um they just use the overheads for that. In which case, if you're if you're really focused on symbols for your overheads, you could do the same thing here. You could just put like a 200 um, hertz low cut um, in your overheads, and basically they become symbol mics at, at that point. Um, so uh, just another approach you can use there. Um, and the ride is very similar. Um, you know, 149, 150 hertz low cut. Um, and then compression again, fairly decent compression. Um, 
very little make or no makeup gain really because you can see I'm already dropping. Now so this this compression is probably dropping at about 10 to 15 dB from the um post compressor signal. Um but since I'm already cutting like 8 uh yeah, 8 dB, um if I were to put the makeup gain back in, I'd have to cut this a lot more. Um I'd have to cut these faders down 20, 25, 30 uh dB. And then now if, if, you know, I'm playing somewhere and, you know, like this, let's say the speaker system just has a lot of like big, you know, cone tweeters with big titanium, um, coils in them, voices in them, um, you, you, you know, that, that, the cymbals and hats might all come through like a lot. And so I would have to, I, if I don't have any more, if I don't have any further to go down and, and I'm going to be in a little bit of trouble. Right, so I, I don't I don't add the makeup gain here. Uh, I think there's still plenty of signal coming in um, for that, and um, yeah, so that's 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 really all the channels that are worth going over. I got a room mic; doesn't there's nothing to that, and I got some other stuff that gets fed into there. The, my TM2 module, I don't do anything. I mean, it's just. The, the, everything is controlled there, so I do have a uh, yeah no no EQ no gate no nothing just just a little bit of gain staging in the input and that's it. Um, so let's talk about the FX <clears throat> a little bit. Uh, this is something that I think uh, might might confuse people as well. Um, there are two different kinds. There's there's um, effects that actually work um, as a channel insert because they have to process the signal in the signal path. And then there are um, FX that can just go on the FX bus. Um, and now you're running a, a, you're kind of splitting the signal and running a part of it through the FX bus and another part is going through, um, you know, to the main left, right, or wherever um, your signal is ending, you know, at a, um, at an aux output or main left, right, wherever it's going. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm I'm using two FX bus filters and two in channel insert filters. Um, the mood filter and the hall reverb. Um, the cool thing about using, I'll show you on the the hall reverb uh, about using these um, FX bus um, effects, and I think reverb is just the classic example of this. Um, in in other mixers it might be different, but in, I'll tell you in this Behringer XR XR18 mixer, uh, the reverb is very very strong. Uh, Hall reverb I consider to be one of the more mild ones, um, but I mean it is just really super echoey and and just very very pronounced. It's a lot of reverb, so that's why you'll see for the overall. Um, amount of the reverb that the signal so by by adjusting these faders you're not changing any volume of the signal itself um what you're doing is you're just changing the amount of the signal that's going through the fx bus and coming back in again um so it won't change volume it just changes the saturation i guess you could call it of the reverb um but the other cool thing, if you go to the actual, um, that particular channel bus, I guess you could call it. I'm not quite sure what to call it. But in, in now in each of my channels, this is the amount of that signal for that specific channel um, that is going into the, the Hall Reverb FX bus. Um, so here you can like really dial up or down relative to all the other channels, how much of the reverb signal. And then when you, um, modify this fader here, this hall reverb fader. Now this is the amount, uh, in proportion to each of those different channels of the reverb going in. So, um, you know, you can see on this, I have very like the, so the kick drum doesn't sound like it has a whole lot of reverb, um, you know, because the, just the way that the kick drum is, uh, just a little bit goes a long way as far as reverb. So I balanced all the reverb out across the, the whole kit in each and every channel. 
to get the right amount of reverb channel by channel. Then if I want just all the reverb for all the whole mix of channels to get increased or decreased, it will increase or decrease proportionate to all of these um, different fader settings through this one. So it's a really cool way I find to be able to adjust that. I don't really do that as much um, with the mood filter. It, it's This is not as pronounced a an effect. So, um, you know, I, I just, they're all pretty even. I just adjust the total amount over here. Um, but for definitely for the reverb, I just found like the snare and the kick just really made the reverb come across um, so strong. Um, you know, so that's why you see those. And then you look for the overheads. I just kept it um, pretty much like, quote, full strength. Because, again, this overhead is getting a complete picture of the whole kit and blending everything together. So it just sounded good adding it back in there rather than a lot of reverb on each individual channel, if that makes sense. But that was the approach I took there. Now, with these other ones, like this stereo enhancer. So this is inserted. Um, I use this particular effect, the, the stereo enhancer, because... Um, it, it helps basically widen a stereo image. So um, you see this spread setting here. Uh, because I have my overheads set up in an XY, they're not physically spread apart very far. They're just pointed in two different directions. Um, but they're in the same location. Adding this stereo enhancer into that set, so this is 9 and 10. So adding that into channels 9 and 10 as an insert just helps widen the stereo image. And that's all I use it for. And it does a great job for, for what I need it to do. Um, and then finally, uh, in my main left-right, I insert this stereo combinator. This is like a multi-band compressor, I guess, um, type of effect. It's pretty complex. There's some videos on it. I highly recommend looking at them because I'll tell you, adding this in really made a great sound come out of my main left rights. I mean, it. I, I haven't really adjusted it a whole lot. Uh, I did very small adjustments to it, and it made a huge difference. I'm kind of afraid of what it might do. I like the sound coming out right now, so I'm not touching it anymore. But, um, you know, this is a very, very complex, but very, very powerful um, effect. Um, really can only be used as an insert, so I... You know, you can't insert across everything. So the only way to insert it across everything is to insert it in your main um, left, right. But, um, you know, that's why it, if you look at these two here, they're, they're really just um, they're, they're nothing. None of this affects anything when you insert them. Um, muting, unmuting, none of that does anything. If you were to mute this, it would actually eliminate reverb altogether. Um, but, but this does nothing when you use inserted effects. Um, so I just, I just leave them like that. And I kind of color code everything. Like, you know, my left, right is this kind of, um, what is that? A, a teal color or something. Um, and then, you know, this, this uh, magenta color for the um, overheads. Um, just a little extra something I do. But I think I think that's really uh, I, I think that's the crux of it. A lot of the other features of this uh, snapshots, um, being able to save and reload snapshots, I use that. I have just a base set of um, settings for um, live indoor, live outdoor, and my home studio that I can just quickly load as just starting points. Well, the home studio one's pretty refined. Um, but you know, I just, these are starting points. I save, um, you can also save channel presets or save a scene. Um, so snapshots get saved right to the, um, right to the Behringer saving a scene saves, saves pretty much the same thing, but as a file. And that's what I actually use, um, more than anything, because it just helps me with, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to give snapshot access to like the guest accounts and stuff like that. But, um, scenes, they can just load. I, and, and I can share scenes more easily. Like I could just send a file for anybody that has like the XR software and they can, they can load it up. Um, and, and it will bring everything in, 
Um, it's, it's just a little easier to manage. So I got a lot of scene files, but I only have a few snapshots. Um, so that's that. Anyway, um, you know, please um, like, share, um, and and subscribe to the channel. But but you know, it, uh, there's probably a lot of people that could really use this information. So uh, hopefully you got a lot out of it. Thanks.